professor of economics and business ethics at the College of uh, Worcester uh, in the US. And he's, um, his research uh, focuses on behavioral economics, labor economics, and experimental economic methods, and specifically on employee ownership and democratic uh, firms. And today he's going to talk about the efficacy of personal incentives in democratic enterprises, evidence, evidence from the lab. And I think from here on, I give it to him. And yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, Alex. I, I, I'm, um, and thanks for organizing this. Uh, I was telling Roberto, you know, it, it almost wouldn't seem right if there wasn't some kind of technological uh, glitch. Uh, during COVID, this is how all of my my uh, the college lectures have been going. Um, so, uh, thanks so much for for uh, organizing the session and for inviting me to 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 this uh, community of scholars. Um, I understand it's a very multi multi discipline disciplinary group, uh, so I've kind of targeted my talk uh, uh, to that particular audience. And certainly, one of the major obstacles of uh, the study of, of workplace democracy or employee ownership is that there are so many of us that are coming from different methodological perspectives, which uh, creates some opportunities, but also many challenges with uh, some redundancies and jargon and, and so on. But really, it's I think these kinds of seminars, these opportunities where we can have a conversation about our different approaches, uh, where we can bridge these gaps. So I think this is a really important um, uh, institution and it's uh, nice, nice to be, uh, nice to be here. So, let me see if I can share my presentation with you. Okay. So, uh, as, as uh, Alexander mentioned, uh, the title of my talk is the efficacy of personnel incentives in democratic enterprises. And I'll pre be presenting some evidence uh, from from uh, some lab studies that I've conducted. Uh, please, I, I'm very open to uh, additional conversation and collaboration. You know, if we were in a uh, non-virtual space, that'd be a little bit easier to organize. But please do reach out to me. Um, uh, my in my information is uh, provided here. Uh, so. The basic plan for my presentation today, I, I, I want to, there may be some, some uh, participants today that are not so familiar with the experimental economic method. And uh, what I really wanna do is try to make a case uh, for the value of using economic experiments to study some uh, very long standing questions uh, that have been made in, 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 in claims in, in the study of democratic and employee owned uh, firms. Uh, I'll go through one specific study with some detail uh, that I conducted with Jeff Carpenter and Peter Matthews uh, that uh, tried to isolate the effect of employee participation in decision making specifically and whether or not this had a motivating effect on uh, workers in a lab setting. And then I'll conclude with a couple of uh, mention of, of some companion projects that extend this general idea that uh, uh, or a general method of using experiments to, to study some of these uh, primary questions that are uh, somewhat contested. So there's a rich uh, theoretical history that we're all familiar with regarding democratically owned and, and worker managed firms. Uh, many, these firms have been uh, deliver promise uh, to to in, uh, reduce inequality or to be potential vehicles for fostering human empowerment. Uh, they could potentially even increase greater civic participation, as Mill has uh, suggested, uh, and so on. I mean, Bowles tells us that they may be technically more efficient, meaning that we may have a redundancy in managers to the extent that uh, the incentives of uh, work, workplace uh, democracy or employee ownership could be powerful enough to overcome uh, free riding issues and, and the like. Uh, Zykson tells us that they can be more innovative and so on. I mean, the, the promise is, is huge and we're, we're familiar with this. Uh, clearly, there are many others, uh, however, that have made more pessimistic claims. Uh, Jensen and uh, Meshlink uh, tell us that, you know, the cost of democratic decision making in firms could be pro prohibitively high. Uh, Williamson says it could be a waste of managerial talent. 
Uh, perhaps the greatest critique uh, that, that is outlined in Alchian Demsitz and other places is that there's a potential for free writing problem that can occur in these institutions that might make them less efficient than their uh, capitalist uh, counterparts. Uh, regardless, uh, the, in 2012, in the United Nations, uh, irrespective of the evidence that was out on a worker cooperative specifically, uh, they declared this the year of international cooperatives. <laughs> Uh, and they wanted to raise public awareness of the invaluable contributions of cooperative enterprises to poverty reduction, employee generation, and social integration, many different things. Uh, the issue here is, is that true? Do these institutions uh, contribute to uh, these rather lofty claims? And it's difficult to know. Uh, Greg Dow tells us that abstract modeling, and this is a bit dated now, this is uh, from his governing uh, the, the Commons book uh, from 2004, he says that abstract modeling has outpaced the evidence, that much of the theoretical discussion leans towards casual storytelling rather than thoughtful analysis informed by factual knowledge. And uh, so this invites empirical researchers like myself and perhaps others in the community to get involved. Uh, the problem is that happenstance data is messy. Uh, I've done a, a handful of traditional econometric studies, and uh, it's very difficult to identify causal linkages. Uh, uh, Boning, uh, Jones and Putterman, uh, some of the leading theorists and, and empirical researchers in the study of employee-owned firms, uh, tell us that happenstance data greatly hinders the ability to uncover systematic behavioral relationships that arise from democratic ownership. Uh, Lawler as well says that obtaining reliable data is difficult, uh, that there's no standard definitions that have been devised in determining the, the proportion of employees involved is problematic, and many uh, defunct uh, uh, firms, I suppose, let's see, uh, programs are still reported as active. Uh, part of this owes to constraints in the data. Uh, now, I'm, a, I'm based in the U.S., and so I'm most familiar with uh, the data constraints here. I believe the situation is better in, in Europe uh, regarding uh, the availability of data. That's my impression. But just to give an example of the data limitations in the U.S., uh, there are 223 known worker cooperatives in the U.S. totaling 2,300 employees. Now, that is a very small number. Uh, the shopping mall that I visit uh, to to you know get my my clothing and things like this uh, has about 150 uh, enterprises uh, totaling roughly 1,500 employees, and that sits in one tiny corner of, of Cleveland. Uh, so there's almost no data, partly because there's very few worker cooperatives in the United States, but there's very little research in the cooperative uh, sector as well. And the lack of data provides a real impediment to studying worker cooperatives and producing scholarship that builds a deeper understanding of both impacts and success factors. That said, there there are some uh, th this this dearth or gap in uh, data, uh, real world data uh, on employee owned and democratic firms has been alleviated with some uh, really terrific data sources um, and a handful of uh, econometric case studies, mainly focused in uh, Mondragon or the Emilia Romagna region, uh, the Evergreen Cooperatives uh, here in, in uh, Northeast Ohio. And then you know some 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 you know large manufacturing firms in the Midwest, which is kind of a moniker for uh, the permission that's granted to researchers to investigate uh, specific firms, but they can't name those firms in their research. Um, to try to bridge the gap between theory and empirics, uh, there has been this small band of researchers uh, to try to redress this empirical uh, balance. That said, and I think uh, those of us who have uh, been working this literature for a while can attest that even though there are some strong leanings in the findings of uh, 
of, of all this research with some of these primary questions, specifically, does workplace participation interact with the motivation and productivity of workers? Is it because of uh, decision making participation? Is it because of the power of the incentives that are involved? Is it because of something else? Uh, this has produced several mixed results. Uh, in some cases we find yes, in some cases we find no, and perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that. However, when we're making theoretical claims that uh, are taking as given the motivating power of democratic institutions in uh, workplaces, perhaps we need to be taking uh, more care with that, or as I'm going to propose, maybe we need to just find better, uh, better, be better data, better analysis. So this is unfortunately a dauntingly difficult empirical question. Uh, and Alan Blinder in his 1990 book of uh, Paying for Productivity uh, tells us you know, that the identification of causal relationships that link structural firm characteristics to employee motivation is tremendously difficult. And this is why. And uh, Boney and jo Jones kind of uh, give us a nice, uh, concise reason as to why this is the case. So consider this challenge to examine product productivity differences between cooperatives and conventional firms. The comparison should be made between firms that are twins in all non organizational respects, technology, the products are generated, market conditions. However, identifying twins is almost impossible because of the existing data on product type and technology are not sufficiently disaggregated. Firm level data that applies consistent accounting conventions to both cooperatives and conventional firms in the same industry are rare. Furthermore, workers are not assigned randomly to uh, uh, cooperatives or conventional firms. Selection biases violate the isolation property. All of these things create econometric problems uh, in, 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 and in the claims that are made based off of the estimations. Uh, moreover, the case studies find significant variation among uh, cooperatives and characteristics that would be accounted for by a, a dummy term to capture unobserved heterogeneity within those enterprises. Uh, however, uh, a propitious uh, direction uh, has been noted and one that I've kind of uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, exploit that uh, perhaps we may be able to use the experimental method uh, to complement some of the other forms of empirical work to get a better sense as to whether some of these first order claims are indeed uh, robust and valid and replicable, which is important. So uh, just to kind of belabor the point just a little bit here, uh, that the, the, the identification of cause relationships and uh, just as full disclosure, I'm a trained economist and uh, it's almost impossible <laughs> to uh, uh, publish anything in the economics discipline uh, without addressing uh, the identification strategy, uh, which the standard of is incredibly high, but it's also kind of opened the door for uh, experimentation, either through randomized controlled trials or lab studies or field experiments. Uh, but uh, it's if we're using happenstance data, just everyday data that we get from firms, it's almost impossible to measure uh, what Alchie and Dempsey's called the metering problem, uh, actual productivity from uh, workers. H how do I, if someone were to measure my own productivity, that'd be a very difficult thing for them to try to uh, estimate. Given most of what I do in my job, which I think is common to other jobs, is unobservable uh, to some extent. It's uh, also certainly task dependent. Some people may look as though they're working uh, uh, much harder than others because of the task that they're performing. Uh, certainly, we're all multitasking. Uh, certainly, there's a, a degree of social capital that's at work in all enterprises uh, where my output is in part a function of what I do in my own uh, work, but also when I'm giving help to others uh, at work, which is not measured or observable. Uh, and many other issues that may complicate the identification of whether someone is more motivated by the participatory structure, either in decision making or in financial participation. Um, and something that's also common in 
the uh, traditional econometric studies that collect happenstance data is oftentimes we'll see the use of uh, control variables that uh, that shouldn't be used. Uh, for example, confounding the effect of financial or decision making participation on productivity, controlling for earnings. Well, uh, perhaps all those things are moving in the same direction at the same time. So there could be some endogeneity. That's a very common issue that comes up in my reading of uh, these studies. Um, insufficient to take account for unobservable heterogeneity and also of course the biggest problem that is almost almost impossible to uh, uh, to control for in traditional studies the self-selection problem of both firms and employees into different institutional uh, governance structures rules and compensation compensation schemes so uh, with experiments we have some advantages uh, specifically, we can, uh, by design, we can control for unobservable firm characteristics that can lead to these identification problems. Uh, we can uh, exogenously, as the uh, experimenter, uh, control for the production technology, the compensation scheme, the governance relations, and we can uh, collect observations on performance uh, with well-defined tasks and well-defined measures of, of the performance. We can even control for the ability of the participants that are uh, going to be governed by different institutional structures within the experiments as well. Uh, another advantage here is that we can take a very specific theoretical model and we can compare predictions of the model to what happens in the experiments. And to the extent that theory is, is rejected, it's relatively easy, not super easy, but relatively easy to uh, test competing explanations for why the theory may uh, 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 may have been rejected. Uh, a third advantage of using experiments is that we can use, um, we can implement institutions in the lab uh, that may not exist very much in the real world. So for example, in the US, as I said, there's a, there aren't very many worker cooperatives. So even if we had perfect data and perfect ability to observe what could be happening in those worker cooperatives and measuring uh, the productivity or helping or social capital or turnover or any of these observable characteristics that we're interested in, um, the, we have a very small limited number. Well, we could create worker cooperatives in a experimental setting uh, for relatively low cost and then we can then test bed how the interaction of different types of institutional structures uh, could could be interacting with with the motivation or the behavior of uh, the subjects. Clearly, there are disadvantages to using experiments, uh, especially lab studies, which is primarily what I've been uh, uh, doing. They're largely unrealistic to some extent. Uh, they participants in economics experiments, there is still a little bit of self-selection. We can't completely control for, totally control for randomization because uh, there are some people who are uninterested in being participants in experiments that might be driving some of the uh, results. Uh, clearly, there may be some questions about external validity. Uh, I'm sure we can have a discussion, uh, we can have a long discussion about this. I think this is something that uh, not only um, economics, but really all forms of, of, of inquiry. Uh, for example, a theoretical model and, and you know modeled it with a neoclassical economic conventions is externally valid only to the extent that some type of environment somehow mirrors the very controlled uh, theoretical uh, prediction. The same would be the, uh, the case with uh, economic experiments. We can only infer that to the extent that similar conditions arise outside of the lab that we've created inside the lab, that what we've learned inside the lab could apply to what's outside the lab. And um, again, I'm sure we can have a long discussion about this, but it is clearly a drawback and uh, does raise questions about the, um, the, 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 the method. There are certainly costs. Uh, to running experiments, and uh, sometimes they're prohibitive. And uh, as I've found out during the pandemic, and I was having a chat 
with uh, uh, Julio uh, prior to the to the uh, talk that sometimes getting these experiments programmed in a uh, computer software is really difficult to running them over the internet because of now the restrictions of the pandemic. Um, it can actually be uh, not a very easy thing for researchers to deal with. Uh, that said, uh, I want to highlight some things that the the lab has uh, some advancements within the broader field of personnel economics, which is you know essentially the study of how personnel respond to uh, workplace incentives. Uh, there have been some systematic, regular, replicable results that I think have changed the way economists are thinking about things. So, for example, we know that there is a wide variance in effort under uh, rank order tournament or, or, or relative payment schemes. Um, we know, and this is this is a result that's very robust, and therefore it has uh, kind of influence the design and implementation of these uh, uh, structures in firms. Uh, we know that there's a strong tendency for workers to reciprocate gift wages. Uh, we know that paying for performance is not at all a straightforward uh, uh, endeavor, that just by introducing an economic incentive, this could potentially uh, crowd out some existing uh, motivation uh, some existing intrinsic motivation uh, that workers may hold, and it could also uh, crowd out some of their social preferences that are important to the well functioning of most work uh, environments. Um, specifically with the uh, application of uh, workplace uh, uh, or, or uh, workplaces that use uh, group incentive schemes, one of the biggest critiques, as I mentioned before, is uh, from Algae and Demsitz, is that these firms would have low power um, incentives because of the free riding or one over n problem, where uh, there could be an incentive for others because they're uh, to free ride off of the efforts of others, uh, since uh, no one person uh, can create the size of the the profit that could eventually be shared. We can. The, the lab suggests that we can handle these questions really, uh, that the one over n problem doesn't really seem to be much of a problem in the lab, that we can overcome this uh, uh, easily. And by extension, I think we can infer that, that it can be overcome within firms as well, uh, just as easily. Uh, this can happen if people have other grounding preferences or if there's communication that's involved or uh, whether or not there's a willingness for some subjects or, or workers to enforce uh, a norm of uh, staying uh, productive, or uh, even if there's some kind of identity uh, that, that is developed within enterprises, which we know that that can happen, uh, this is enough to overcome the free writing issue in experimental settings and I think also in firms. So, uh, just to kind of summarize my my main research program, and then I'll go uh, briefly through one study to kind of give an example of this research, is uh, that I use the the lab to study some of these long-standing I call them first-order questions uh, because the intuition of these claims has been repeated so much um, about the behavioral effects of institutions found in employee-owned and/or democratically governed firms. Uh, so the study I'm going to talk about is, is one that was published in the Journal of uh, uh, Experimental Economics uh, with Jeff Carpenter and Peter Matthews, uh, where we are, we're looking at the motivating effect of participatory management. And this was uh, research that was sponsored by the Foundation of Enterprise Development and the National Science Foundation. And our main question of interest was, uh, does participatory management affect motivation? Uh, it seems as though there's a very strong intuitive appeal that it would, uh, but there are very checkered results when we look, very mixed results when we look at uh, happenstance data on the question. Many times it says uh, we, there have been uh, results that suggest that is the case, other times not. Uh, but we want to see if we can find a clean way to evaluate this question. Uh, I actually conducted these experiments in, in Valencia. They have a wonderful experimental economics lab there. Um, and 
uh, yeah, this is what it looks like. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with economic experiments, uh, there's a large uh, computer uh, network. Subjects come in. Uh, we restrict communication. Uh, we sit behind glass. We, we try to pretend like we're scientists. And uh, they uh, uh, work their way through the computer network. They're connected where their decisions are directly tied to their own payment and to the payment of others as well. And, so, and we, we pay with, with real money. So in this particular study, uh, the subjects learned uh, that a task was going to be performed and then they familiarized themselves with the work task. OK, this is what it was. They had to add up these uh, simple two digit uh, or sum up these these two digit sequences. And uh, they were paid for their performance here. There's something that we had uh, tested before. There's no systematic reason to believe that there would be bias in this uh, particular task. Um, after practicing with that work task, uh, we randomly and anonymously assigned uh, the subjects into groups of four. Uh, and then we randomly assigned, well, we told them that they would be randomly assigned uh, to either being a manager or to being a worker. So there's one manager, three workers, and their earnings in the study were directly tied to the performance of the three workers of, uh, of the foreign group. The manager in this particular setup did not uh, engage in any work. Uh, each correct answer provided by a single worker generated 75 uh, cents of revenue for the firm uh, or the group of four. The manager received uh, 25 cents for each correct answer provided by uh, every worker. And the remaining, uh, the 50 cents remaining uh, of the value produced for every correct response was used for compensation for workers in one of two different ways. Uh, they could either be paid a piece rate where they earned 50 cents for every correct answer or uh, depending on uh, the, the decision of the manager, uh, they they uh, could have been compensated through a rank order tournament where the highest performing worker received 60% of the total proceeds, the second highest performer uh, received 30% and the lowest 10% of the total proceeds. Uh, the manager uh, had a choice. The manager had ultimate decision control rights by in our design. They could either unilaterally implement the piece rates they could unilaterally implement the tournaments, the, rank, the the relative payment structure, or they could delegate this decision to workers who were going to be voting on their preferred compensation scheme. So in the protocol, at this point, this is what subjects knew, which is important for our identification strategy. They knew the work task, they knew the two roles, they, they had not yet been assigned roles, uh, they knew the value of a correct answer. They knew the compensation rate of the manager, the two potential compensation schemes facing the workers. They knew that managers had ultimate deci decision control rights. And then at this point, uh, we collected stated preferences, uh, or they're basically hypothetical preferences. How would you like to be compensated if you were to be uh, assigned as a worker and if you were to be assigned as a manager? Um, so this is important because this is going to serve as a as a control uh, in the development of an instrumental variable. Uh, at that point, and after subjects knew this, uh, the roles were randomly assigned. Uh, workers and managers saw simultaneous decision screens. Uh, the manager was given the option to either implement unilaterally the piece rate, the tournament, or to delegate this choice to workers. And in the way that this at the same time, workers were uh, voting on their preferred compensation scheme. So if the manager unilaterally implemented the, the piece rate, that was what the group was going to be governed by. Um, or if they were to delegate the choice of the workers, then the votes that were cast by the workers uh, were going to be causal and they were going to uh, either vote to have implemented the piece rate or the tournaments. Um, so after the compensation scheme was uh, decided, either unilaterally or through uh, delegation, they were informed on the process of how that decision came about. Uh, they performed work for 14 minutes and then there was a, uh, a survey and we paid subjects. 
the basic findings are as follows. Well, just to kind of show uh, who was involved and, and what the balance of the uh, subject's pool was. Um, so when I say no participation, no participation, participation was uh, when the manager uh, uh, allowed the votes of the sub the workers to be causal um, and no participation was when there was a unilateral implementation of the compensation scheme. Uh, essentially from here, uh, we're just trying to see whether or not we had balance in our uh, data and uh, we did not have any systematic uh, differences between the two uh, treatments, which um, uh, at this at this stage. This is kind of a, 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 a the um, cumulative distribution function of the or, or the frequency function of uh, the distribution of effort throughout the experiment is roughly normal, which allows us to use some uh, parametric techniques. And uh, in our identification strategy, we really wanted you know clean estimates of how workers responded to their voice being uh, causal. And in order to do this, uh, we needed to control for the self-selection effect. Uh, we do this in a couple of different ways. First, there is randomization of uh, subjects to groups. And then there is randomization to the role. So of either being a manager or a worker. And then crucially, we wanted to control for preferences of a compensation scheme, but we could not use the decisions that were causal in determining the compensation scheme because this would uh, be endogenous to the uh, and, and potentially keep us in the self-selection uh, 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 issue. So this is why we collected hypothetical preferences before any of the random assignment uh, took place. And we need to establish whether or not they were uh, correlated with the observations of the real uh, preferences that were expressed by both workers and managers. And so to establish this, uh, we first uh, in the you know, let's see if I can get my pointer here. Uh, we have the uh, here. Th th these are the hypothetical uh, preferences of managers and the real uh, decisions that were taken by managers uh, conditional on the hypothetical roles that they were going to be in. So they didn't know whether they were going to be managers, but they were making a decision as if they were going to be a manager. Uh, and we see that uh, there was relatively high uh, uh, correlation here. Um, so uh, this is one justification, but we need to look at this a little bit more systematically uh, for our instrumental variable. Uh, so we have uh, a multinomial uh, logit here where uh, the baseline category is whether the manager decided to use the piece rate or the tournament and or seating control rather is the um, the reference group. So essentially we're interested is whether there's a high enough correlation between the hypothetical preferences and the actual uh, preferences. And we see that is uh, the case for both the piece rate and uh, the tournament, which gives us confident that using the hypothetical preferences is uh, going to be an appropriate instrument when we control for preferences in our final estimation. We do the same thing with workers. Uh, we have again the hypothetical preferences of workers and then their uh, their votes that could have been causal only if the um, or or they 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 knew that they they could be causal depending on whether the a manager was going to allow them to be uh, a causal, and we see that there is a very high uh, correlation here again, um, which means that we can use or the hypothetical preferences as an instrumental variable in our estimation, so we can control for the preferences by and avoid the endogeneity problem of potentially using the actual uh, preferences that were uh, expressed. So uh, again, this is uh, a, just a regression showing that the worker preferences predicted that the a priori hypothetical preferences uh, predicted the, the votes um, to justify our main estimation, which I'll show you in one slide. This first initial slide just shows uh, when the votes were allowed to be causal, 
that we did see some kind of productivity uh, difference. So when workers were involved, uh, or when their 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 votes were allowed to be causal by the manager, those workers conditional on their or actually at this point not conditional on anything, they worked harder than uh, those that did not had their compensation scheme unilaterally uh, implemented. Uh, and this is kind of the main finding of the paper. Uh, so when the manager allowed the votes of the workers to be causal and controlling for uh, some characteristics that the literature has shown to be um, potentially problematic. So we wanted to to control for ability and, and uh, gender, uh, uh, whether or not subjects were good at math and how competitive they were. And then crucially, these preferences of the workers themselves, we see that there is an 11 percentage point uh, productivity difference for workers that were allowed to have their vote be causal after co controlling for ability, the gender, their math ability, their level of competitiveness, and crucially, their preferences for the compensation scheme. Uh, to try to uh, validate this or or to uh, uh, this the, the finding we, we conduct a number of, of robustness checks um and we find that the crucial we're looking at the the top row here uh it's not as though our finding was an artifact of the way that we estimated our uh, regression and so uh to the, the in summary, uh, we found a large, I think, you know, 11 percentage points is actually quite large uh, productivity uh, difference and significant of participation on worker output. Uh, the difference in output between workers and participatory firms or those that were allowed for their voice to be made causal versus the no voice uh, firms or groups in our experiment was about 11 or 12 percentage points, uh, which was larger but nonetheless uh, similar to a related estimate that um, I found with in a different paper uh, from 2014. So we do have that the main contribution here is that we have a causal uh, link between employee voice and productivity that is uh, uh, controlled for all of the things that we could think of that might um muddy this result and we think that the main contribution here is that in the absence of naturally occurring data and this this is the key issue is that if we rely on happenstance data to allow us to test some of the long-standing hypotheses uh we're likely to continuously be frustrated um so i think that there's a role for experiments uh, here to complement some of those traditional econometric studies. Um, because data are limited, number one, uh, they are riddled with self-selection issues either by the firm or by workers perhaps selecting into those firms. And uh, of course, the unobservable heterogeneity, which is always a difficult thing to control for. And I think that uh, this result uh, can help substantiate some of the common claims that are made about workplace democracy and their behavioral impacts. Um, so I just in the last couple of slides here, I just want to uh, talk about some companion pieces that might have been of interest. I was wasn't sure what exactly I wanted to share with you, so I thought I'd just kind of share some of the main findings of a, a companion piece here, uh, which is much more straightforward, actually. So in this uh, study, uh, we had, again, uh, a number of subjects that came in and they were just randomly assigned different compensation schemes. One where there was uh, no employee ownership, no sharing of the residual, which actually was, uh, they were just given a flat wage that was very good, a very good flat wage for their work. And then uh, we actually substituted um, claim on the residual. So uh, where subjects could either have a lower fixed wage and a, a small amount of a share of profits, or they could have an even smaller fixed wage 
and a larger share of fixed profits. And we found that in it didn't matter, regardless, the uh, fixed wage did not perform as well as either a small amount of ownership of the residual claim or a large amount of the residual claim. Um, and that was measured both by uh, the, the quality of the effort provided in the study and also the uh, intensity of the effort that was in the study. One final thing that I was just working on yesterday, which I, is something I'm, I'm kind of excited about, is uh, the, uh, a working paper uh, where I'm interested in, in co-worker helping under different compensation structures. Uh, so in this uh, table kind of summarizes the, the main finding thus far, which is um, that so in this particular experiment, uh, subjects were either paid a, a piece rate or a, a profit sharing scheme. Um, the profit sharing scheme actually has a lower expected uh, overall uh, compensation than the piece rate does. So it's a lower powered incentive, yet uh, there's a higher amount of worker to worker helping on a, a computerized task. So uh, there are a couple of contributions in this piece. The main one is that it's very difficult to measure peer-to-peer -peer helping. Um, you know, it's a very, uh, in, using uh, happenstance data, once again, it's mo mainly been done through survey work. Uh, but here we have direct observations on when workers stop working on their own projects and start helping people on other projects. And uh, we see that that is highly uh, correlated, or here, we're not quite done with the analysis. But it seems as though um, the intuition that a profit sharing contract would uh, encourage more uh, work, worker to worker helping. Um, with, compared to a study that was done by um, uh, Bob Drago and, and, and uh, Garuvi, a um, uh, famous paper published in the Journal of Labor Economics, they used uh, happenstance data and actually uh, found an opposite result. So they found that profit sharing led to lower uh, sharing of tools, specifically in an Australian uh, firm context. So this lab data uh, kind of contradicts in some respects what they're finding uh, suggested. Uh, final thoughts here, uh, as far as future directions, this is the beginning really. There aren't, I, I'm very excited to hear that there are other uh, people do, that are doing experiments um, related to themes on uh, workplace democracy or employee ownership and related institutions. Um, and so we need to uh, certainly increase the amount of studies. Uh, no single study uh, is enough to claim anything about truth. Uh, we know this, uh, so we, we need more of these and we need to replicate uh, each other's work as well. And then finally, uh, we need to move uh, and, and, and use uh, more field experimentation techniques. And again, I know this is something that's being done, uh, but this is uh, uh, clearly uh, something that needs to complement what we're learning in traditional econometric studies and also uh, in the lab. So uh, I think that's the end of my, my presentation. Um, and uh, I'm very uh, excited to, to continue our dis uh, discussion. So I'll come back to the main screen. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I can't see everybody now in, in Teams. I can only see your um, yeah, initials. Um, so if you have a question, maybe just uh, use maybe your voice. We, <laughs> or maybe um, we can use the chat. Yeah, or the chat. Or the chat. Yeah, I, I see yeah. a hand. Um, in the participant, I, Lisa, I, I see a hand there. Yeah. Uh, ah, there nice to meet you. There. Right, great. Can so, I? Yeah. yeah. Yes, forward. Lisa, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that talk. That was fascinating. So I'm from philosophy. I, I know very little about these methodologies, but it, I find it really great that you find interest stuff that goes in the direction that I would like to see, which is, of course, nice. But I wanted to ask you about the degree of contact between people in these studies, 
And the reason I'm asking is um, because as we all know, experience, I mean, the future of work is going to be far less personal contact and far less sort of the kind of working shoulder by shoulder that you saw in the past. And there will be much more digital contacts and people might not even know who is actually working for the same uh, employer when it's mediated through platforms or so. so. But it sounded like in the study there was no like personal interaction between people. It was just a scheme of things and they could choose. They wouldn't know, w would they meet the others with a sort of eye contact or was it completely anonymous? Thank you. So uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that, so in this in this particular study, uh, it was purposely anonymous grouping. Uh, certainly, I think a very important extension of the study, which could be incorporated into a series of of extensions, would be to lift that anonymity. And this is partly um, kind of the, the the playbook I think of of how experimental economics has developed is to really uh, start in the most sterile environment where you should really you're you're trying to find something that. Um, make it as difficult as possible to find a result and then to kind of fold in additional things. Now, if we were to compare the results of this study with the exact same setup, with the exception that we allowed uh, chats to happen, let's say between some of the subjects, or if we, that would be in, in experimental economics, a completely novel contribution to the field and, and something that we do see these series of papers that kind of come out in this way to then say, well, uh, maybe there's a multiplicative effect of uh, participation when uh, the subjects have some familiarity with another. It seems that to me like that would be a very uh, plausible uh, idea. It could also work the other way, though, right? There could be a workplace dynamics where um, uh, uh, th th that develop. And, and there have been some interesting papers. Some of my co-authors have, have done some work on uh, some of the antisocial behavior. Uh, that is endemic to uh, groups, uh, uh, depending on some of these institutional factors that can be studied, uh, seratus paribus, so to speak, within the lab by adding them in one at a time. So uh, I think that's a, uh, just to answer directly, it wasn't done in this paper intentionally, but clearly I think it could be and probably should be uh, done in the future. Um, so I saw Roberto was next on the list, if I didn't miss anybody. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Phil. I mean, I, um, like Lisa, I'm, uh, I'm a philosopher and, uh, and uh, I, I'm, I mean, I, I, I find extremely interesting the, the kind of contribution you can get from experimental economics precisely because uh, you try to to make a very small contribution but at the same time uh, uh, unambiguous somehow I mean as long as you try to rule out all the all the um, all the options you you are, you are not studying and and uh, and uh, and that is I mean potentially um, extremely interesting now of course the question is uh, always to what extent the situation you create uh, is uh, really representative of uh, of the workplace in general, or whether you are not simply testing uh, a very specific things, which is more or less student in a lab. And of course, I guess the answer is between the two. But I wanted to 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 make some comments or ask or or, or questions concerning how this this risk could be uh, taken into account. Uh, uh, still remaining into into a lab situation because of course if you go into into reality that would be a, a different way to solving it and uh, one thing uh, which to me would be interesting to see I mean so there are three dimensions on which would be interesting to know whether uh, they could be taken into account experimentally or whether it's just too complex to to modelize it. And the first one uh, is, 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 is the question of uh, learning, uh, um, learning democracy and the sense in which there are studies showing that uh, besides the, the, the problem of self-selection, there is also the question that people ought to learn how to behave in a, in a democratic setting in which they do not simply obey orders, but 
learn to take decision with others. And this is something that, for example, all the literature on, on deliberative democracy, uh, participatory democracy, they, it just shows that people begin, and at the beginning they don't know what does it mean to decide with others. They may be scared, they may simply don't know how to respect others, etc. And in the course of time, as long as they continue, um, they became more proficient and then they, they love it. And so the question is whether with some kind of... Uh, uh, longitudinal uh, experiment, uh, this could be done, or because you always change your uh, your um, uh, subject because of the methodology, it's impossible to have this kind of re re repeated games uh, uh, in, in times. Uh, the second one concerns, uh, uh, if you want, the psychosocial traits of, uh, of the subject you involve in a lab experiment. In, in, the, in the sense in which, as far as I know, uh, most of the time there are students in a lab, as I said. And, uh, and there are two possible uh, um, contextual uh, aspects which could uh, bias your experiment, and so it would be interesting to test it in different situations. The one is that uh, you have studies showing that someone uh, somehow uh, preferences for democratic means of, uh, or, of, of um, managing a group correlate positively with uh, education, for example. So the more you are educated, the more you prefer to your voice being taken into account instead of having someone deciding for you. And therefore, if you are an experimental subject as um, graduate or undergraduate students, you're still testing with the uh, extremely highly educated uh, section of the population compared to the people you find in the, in the workplace. So it would be interesting to have this done with the uh, people with lower um, educational levels. And the other one is that uh, uh, we know also uh, from soci sociology and psychology that uh, collective decision making works best or tend to be preferred when situations are uh, low stress. And, uh, and uh, another interesting thing would be whether you can uh, change the, the stressing uh, quality of situations so that people maybe uh, in more uh, anxious situations uh, they would prefer uh, uh, to have a dictator deciding for them or whether it doesn't change. Uh, and the other thing of course is, uh, but this is a even uh, more complex question, is to what extent uh, the methodological constraint you have when you design a lab experience can be uh, aren't uh, somehow uh, preventing to test the thing you want to test, which is uh, democracy in the sense in which when you are into a, a, a work, um, democratic workplace, uh, for a workplace to be democratic, uh, you have lots of conditions to be there. Uh, and, and so the question is whether maybe you can simply split this condition like, you maybe hinted at this before, like saying you can test once uh, um, share ownership, and other times you can test uh, uh, co-decision with manager. In another experiment, you can test uh, uh, decision of uh, who is going to be the manager. I don't know. I mean, different. But the question is, if if you think there is a way to recompose this rich com uh, institutional complexity, which is somehow uh, definitional of what democracy is uh, with the methodology that by necessity somehow has to simplify so as to test only one single thing at a time. So sorry for the long question, but... Uh, no, so, uh, no, thank you. Uh, terrific uh, points. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to take them uh, a little bit in, in order here because I think all of them are, are really, really uh, uh, great. Uh, so the first about uh, whether or not there's uh, th whether the practice of democracy is something that can be learned in a lab setting and, and then therefore evaluated. Uh, well, I can answer this from from a couple different perspectives. Uh, there have been some studies uh, that not in the specific case of of uh, democratic institutions and, and and practicing with uh, democracy. But that do try to see the extent to which there's some uh, endogeneity, some 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 endogenous preferences that form through repeated actions, 
and uh, and see what there are some spillover effects uh, between these. Now, a lot of these have been done uh, in evaluation and, and challenge of, again, very, very, very small, very, very small uh, uh, changes from the rational actor model. Uh, so to the extent that whether uh, altruism that is practiced in one setting uh, can extend to a slightly different setting with repeated interactions. And th th there could be some models for, uh, uh, you know, cooking up democracy in one case and, and giving people practice with it and seeing how it develops over time. It, I, I think I, it may be on the scope of the lab, but there have been some attempts that have been made with uh, by, by others studying different questions to, to try to evaluate that. But I think that's a very crucial um, uh, uh, element in, in, in with, with workplace democracy in general. Um, I'm reminded of uh, uh, the uh, Bowles and Ginsis book, uh, Schooling in Capitalist America, which is really uh, the, the main thesis is that the form of education in the US case uh, is, pro is probably more deterministic in the behavioral practice of uh, students than the actual content of, of, of that. So, you know, we have in the US, the uh, I think it's even called the, the West Point model of education, which is the uh, students sit in rows, uh, you know, like the army, there's the sergeant at the front, you know, so we, we learned to, uh, you know, kind of respect the authority in specific ways. And so uh, the, the the thesis from from the book is is that uh, because we are within the institution of education being more or less uh, groomed to be kind of docile, obedient, readily incentivized workers, then perhaps what we need to do is change the form of education. Now, one study I have thought about, which is sort of related to your question, would be to uh, establish the extent or to, to, to do a, a field experimental study to see whether the practice of democracy is easier for students that practice democratic education. Uh, and we there are several examples of that uh in 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 the US there there are some schools that have uh, a higher degree of democratic practice that's a question as far as i know and perhaps i'm i'm wrong about this that hasn't been investigated to 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 really test whether the repeated practice of democratic ritual um within the education system is working to the extent that people are getting better at at being uh uh uh, potentially cooperators and cooperatives uh, down the road, or um, which I think is a part of the philosophy in the Mondragon uh, Corporation, right? The education system has been restructured in order to uh, try to support and produce uh, cooperators that will eventually be entering in different uh, workplace uh, systems. So I don't know if it fits the traditional lab study uh, setting, but I think a, a field experiment perhaps could be uh, the, the the most appropriate way to, to to address that issue, which is I think super important. Uh, the second point about um, about the, the the subjects that we're using in these lab studies. Now, of course, ninety nine point nine percent of the studies are using uh, what we call you know convenient samples of students. You know anyone we can get. Now students are readily incentivizable. They're around. We can bring them in, and that's a problem. Uh, and this has been extensively uh, written about and debated within the experimental uh, uh, literature uh, because we do know that subject effects matter. Uh, the composition of the groups matters. Um, we know that we a, a robust founding that is is found among a student population of 18 to 22 year olds uh, is likely to be different depending on the uh, the, the real life experiences of, of people that are that are in their working. Uh, environments. Uh, so I don't see that as a limitation so much as an opportunity to see the whether or not um, uh, for, for, for future research to 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 extend some of the same baseline studies and see if they are robust to uh, other environments and other subjects pools. Um, the the uh, your third point about uh, the stress and uh, decision making is uh, there so stress is in a parallel literature in, in the kind of what I could call the the, the neuroeconomic literature 
uh, has a uh, is is very hot right now, and there there are ways that we can induce uh, people to feel stress in the lab. Um, uh, one thing that again I'm not sure about, and I think is very provocative uh, through your question, is is whether these group decisions are systematically affected under those stimuli. So whether whether or not uh, we we can put someone in a stressful situation. And perhaps, but as you suggest, maybe uh, they would rather take a pass on making a collective decision and, and rather delegate that to a single uh, a dictator or, or whatever. Um, so I, I think I think that that could be very, very interesting. Um, I actually had a, uh, a student, uh, this is an, uh, an undergraduate student, but he, he had an interesting idea about uh, the role of stress and end of life uh, choices. And so he was actually creating stressful situations for uh, subjects that had to make a, a decision. And there, there we learned, or I learned through his work that there are uh, five or six uh, ways to really stress people out <laughs> in, in, in a controlled setting, uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting. So um, the, uh, in your final point here uh, regarding the uh, uh, methodological constraints. This is a. I think this is this is where we have to kind of stop with with experiments to some extent, and 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 be open to other uh, uh, approaches. I mean, I I don't think uh, so. It's not a. It would be imprudent uh, for for me to uh, try to say that. Uh, we can use experiments to learn all aspects of truth regarding uh, workplace democracy and in, uh, employee ownership. That's not uh, the role of the method uh, that is overselling the method. That is probably wrong um, because we are looking at such minute uh, issues. So it really has to be taken, I think, in a broader global context with you know people in this community that are analyzing the question in, in several different ways and to again, uh, keep lines of communication open across these different disp disciplinary boundaries, which is difficult. But I, I think, you know, there, there is a, uh, uh, a, a, a genuine need for uh, learning uh, from one group to the other. And, and I don't think that the lab uh, is the right place to, to look at, um, uh, you know, all aspects of these things. But they, they, they can give us insight to perhaps build a better theory or, um, or, or, or to inspire perhaps uh, different ways of, of collecting uh, uh, data uh, in, in other settings. So uh, th those are yeah excellent points and, and very thought uh, provoking for me. So, so thank you for that. Um, currently there's no question in the chat. Uh, okay, now we got one by, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, yeah, Julio. Hi, Phil. Thanks for a very interesting presentation, which I enjoyed very much. And um, I'm just uh, two points, two observations, more than actually question per se on the, on the paper you presented. The first one is related to one element, which uh, in, a, in a sense struck me a bit when you mentioned about the US data, the kind of very, very small number of COPs, according to your statement, I mean, workers' COP. And that made me think about whether the reasoning we are doing also in the team at Unibo, we are trying to do also field experiments on cooperatives and so on, is relevant to think about not necessarily the abstract concept of participation, which obviously, as you said, is one element of the methodology of uh, experimental economics, as in general, that is the methodology to test one little element of behavior. But for instance, to consider whether different sectors of activity could present different characteristics of participation and democracy. For instance, if I do not remember incorrectly, I read a, a long time ago a classic papers on the plywood industry in the US as being a cooperative industry. But I think still, for instance, the banking sector has got quite a lot of representation of co-ops. So uh, my point is whether 
uh, the different sectors, and partially you mentioned that when you mentioned the empirical evidence available, could be also an added element, even though the context is difficult to trace causally to participatory ways. And that's one point. The other point is more related to the actual practice of democracy in, let's say, participatory firms such as cooperatives and so on, or social enterprises. Because, for instance, just to cite an anecdote, I talked to one of the leading, let's say, cooperative leaders uh, in Italy, and the pandemic, he told me, that has created a much stronger participation than the traditional general assemblies where people have to go, whereas but now online, the turnout was much higher because people stayed home and they can connect. So this simple anecdote shows that for them in general, participation in the decision making by workers or members is a big problem, as you know. But then the question could be, could be also could we be also interested in uh, testing either empirically or in the lab the fact that we have different degrees of participation and that is important because voter voter turns up, turnout is a relevant issue in democracies if you have a democracy when only 40% of the people vote clearly that's very much different from a, a democracy where 80% of the people vote. So, for instance, in large co-ops in Italy, very few people turn out to vote. And so, also in the lab, I guess, or a different way to say that also in the workplace, you have uh, members of the co-op and workers who are not members. So, what we are actually practicing in terms of participation could also differ on the degree of the structure of the workforce and in the ways in which participation is organized. So obviously some of the questions are more related probably to field experiment and experiment, ex empirical work, but I think something possibly, and I would like to have your opinion on this, uh, could be in a way isolated in the lab. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent points. Um, uh, so certainly the finding in the paper that I shared with you uh, is not exclusive to democratic enterprises. Um, there uh, can be different kinds of workplaces where different types of participation happens. I happen to work I, I don't know if I would call it a traditional capitalist firm or, or what my college would be, but it, it, is, uh, uh, it is it is one that's compl complex. I'm not sure where the location of the uh, surplus product is or, or who owns it, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how the the uh, incentive structure is, is is based on that and and how I react to it, but uh, certainly. It is highly participatory in decision making, um, and there are some kind of legal things as a part of my own workplace experience that uh, make that so. So I, I think um, this adds to the to the to the issue, of the problems of, of interdisciplinarity, and and may challenge some of the ways that we in this group are are thinking about our our research, and and also where we're. Um, uh, uh, gathering some of our, our, our insights from, from related literatures. Uh, teamwork is something that happens in a lot of places. Group incentives happens in a lot of places. Uh, Decision-making participation happens in, in places that uh, the profit goes to one person. So the, uh, I, I, I think we probably need to expand uh, of the, the the studies uh, to, to to go beyond some of this, uh, one of my um, you know intellectual heroes and, and personal friends, uh, Avner Ben Nur, he's he's done a lot of work on on teamwork um, that applies and dovetails with a lot of the research on um, uh, a workplace democracy and in employee owned firms, uh, and he's very uh, explicit about the, the this idea that um, maybe the way that we are. So 
the 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 Democracy at Work Institute that conducted the survey, for example, that found 223 work worker cooperatives in the U.S. That's a trivial number. That's a tiny number of of enterprises. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't study workplace democracy, right? Because that could happen in all kinds of, of places that are not just worker cooperatives. So we still need to learn something about democratic institutions because they exist even in uh, traditional firms call them. Um, uh, and and the, same, the same would be true for uh, uh, compensation structures that may not be registered as cooperative as such. But uh, perhaps, you know, the, the, the profit sharing is ubiquitous. The case, you know, so I'm a part of this uh, research community uh, here in the States uh, that some of you are familiar with that studies employee ownership, which is defined very broadly within that community. Uh, so uh, employee ownership can, can be not just worker cooperatives, um, but also, you know, employee stock owned uh, firms, uh, which some of which are very participatory in their participation, some of which are are not. Um, the and if we look at the number of people that work under those types of uh, arrangements, where they have a, a share of stock in the enterprise they're working in, or they have a stock purchasing plan, or they have uh, a stock option, uh, uh, perhaps. It covers upward of uh, 25 million people in the U.S., which is a, a, a huge number of people that, that uh, participate financially. If we include now profit sharing schemes on top of that, the number explodes even more. So uh, I was definitely a little bit I, I'm trying I was trying to be provocative with the presentation of that uh, slide showing the paucity of data on uh, worker cooperatives. But it certainly doesn't mean that there aren't institutions that either share uh, or, or have financial participation or decision making participation uh, that crisscross in all kinds of different dimensions. And so that that is a challenge and an opportunity for sure uh, 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 for us. Now, um, I, I, I forget your, your your second question or maybe well, briefly, very before. briefly, I was saying that, uh, for instance, the experience of, you know, Italian situation, we have uh, because of the history of cooperative movements in Italy, we have now large cooperatives in terms of employees, but with a limited number of members, meaning owners. Yes. Yeah. So right. that poses an issue of democracy because some of the members who are deciding about the strategic choices directly or indirectly through management are a very limited number compared to the total number of employees who are workers under contract. And, uh, you know, there is a debate whether this company could be really called democratic say, or instead are just like, you know, a club where the old members have a lot of power and uh, the others are, let's say, under control. There is an issue with unions and so on and so on. So, uh, to make it a bit of a metaphor of the political situation, different countries have very difficult, different turnout at elections. So we all call them democracy, but the actual degree of practice democracy is different. So I think you made a very good parallel in the previous point about profit sharing and so on. We need, I think, to look at this a, a bit of as a continuum of situations. Uh, my only point would be that in an lab setting or in a field work setting, clearly working in a continuum is difficult. It's better in a way possibly to have a theoretical model when you can use parameters and you can, you know, uh, calibre the parameters. But normally in a simpler setting, that's why I was wondering whether this binary division between members and non-members could be, you know, something to think about whether to test uh, as one element of the discussion we are having about democracy. Absolutely. I, I, I think that that's a, uh, a, a super timely important and germane question for, uh, for, for for the study of cooperatives specifically. And I, I can imagine, and I would love to, to continue this conversation uh, perhaps offline in the design of the study to, to try to, to look at that. But I, I, I think uh, it, it's a it's a problem for the most successful cooperatives as well, right? I mean, uh, yeah. Monterey has been dealing with this issue for a long time. Um, uh, and even some of the 
yeah, I, I think that's an excellent uh, and important area of, of inquiry. And I, I think the lab might be be a place where we could gain some insights with that, but we'd have to think hard about it. So well, I hope we'll have an opportunity soon to possibly yeah. talk a bit more about that. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I got Daniela next and then Lisa again. Um. Hi, Phil. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is related to the paper, the other is more general. So uh, the, it's about the idea of what participation really means in this setting, maybe in the experiment. Because one might actually try to um, say work, um, kind of spell out the idea of participation. And maybe, so the question is, is there kind of underlying what we call causal mechanism that would explain why your experiment yields those results in terms of, you know, enhanced productivity? Because it might be two ways, I may be wrong, and actually you might have said that on the paper, but one is the idea there might be a sense of participation as to commitment to a shared decision. So um, maybe another idea might be identify, when you actually participate, you actually identify more closely with a, with a, you know, the, the um, not, you know, with a um, enterprise itself, I mean, with a cooperative in this case. So, um, so there are way, many ways I want to say in which you can spell out the concept of participation in terms of solidarity, um, but even you know just again commitment to uh, some sort of uh, common and shared end. So, uh, so the question is if again you just start uh, uh, you know over and beyond the idea, then there is a correlation which I see where you can give an explanation in terms of some. Um, you know, concept which might also be normatively relevant, let's say, for philosophers that can actually be used. Again, um, you know, concept like solidarity or identification with a, you know, with a shared hand of uh, of the group. Uh, the more general question is about actually is related to what was asked before. So, if I'm not wrong, so your experiment is about, um, you know, model of it more or less very horizontal, you know, democratic workplace in which is the minimal management and there are workers. But again, there might be cases like in the case of the Italian cooperatives where it can have actually owners and then employees. Now, one interesting thing, and I was thinking, well, it might be interesting if we could actually do, I don't know if it's possible for uh, mm, experimental economies, but to say something about role of traditional, um, you know, group interest uh, organization like trade unions, right, in the history of the enterprise. Uh, and I'm asking that because sometimes, um, say, um, you know, just enter, uh, I mean, just into traditional firms and say um, trade unions have been accused sometimes of being actually only protect only group interests of the workers. But at the same time, you want to say trade unions have very, at least historically speaking, important role in democratizing enterprises. So uh, this is a case when there is a more uh, hierarchical structure and intermediate bodies like trade unions, that of course, play a role. I don't know if experimental economists can say anything about this or can actually devise experiment to that, you know, just sort out. Um, OK. Yeah, that's I. Uh... My, my 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 snap reaction to the question is probably not. Um, I I don't know if that would be appropriate for for the lab. I I think it something could be done. I can imagine a design where uh, there's a union and and there's some some um, some interplay that's that's going on between negotiations with the union and and, and ownership and then uh, election to the to the. Uh, union board and and so on and paying dues, I I, I I could see a simulation of of what could be happening. I don't. I would ha not have a lot of confidence in. Um, well, I don't know. I'd have to think hard about it. It seems as though it 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 might be too complex. Like the the level of uh insight that most experimental studies operate at are uh is at a very very small scale which which again limits the by construction the external validity of of the finding uh, in, in any of these studies um 
but so I, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to think hard about that. My, my initial reaction is that I, I don't know if it would be appropriate for the lab. Your, your, your first point um, about, again, uh, super important, the uh, whether and, and uh, uh, Roberto actually mentioned this as well uh, about, you know, what is democracy and is this really being am I really capturing democracy in the uh, in the study? No, I'm not actually because there, there's more than just voting on a compensation scheme. All I look at is whether or not subjects vote on a compensation scheme and whether or not that vote, if being causal, is now has a motivating effect. That's that's all I can say because that's all that happened. Um, there was no uh, like Lisa brought up the point of of additional um, interaction among uh, the subjects. There was none by 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 construction. So um, it's maybe a little bit disingenuous to say that the, the the paper or when i say in the paper that i'm measuring something about participation or democracy uh that might be disingenuous to, to to the concept um because it is more than just what is happening in the paper which is subjects had an opportunity to vote on a compensation scheme and the managers had an opportunity to not let that vote be causal uh and that that's in that one circumstance, in that one uh, set of studies with 240 subjects, I found that when the vote was causal, subjects performed at a higher level after controlling for some other factors that we think might also be contributing to higher performance. Um, and and I think you know extrapolating more from the results would would probably be um, an over overstep. Um, and Lisa, I saw here in the chat you, you mentioned it. Are, there's empirical research on the new platform cooperatives and movement. Not that I'm aware of, honestly. And, and um, but uh, I, 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 they're, they're just not. It hasn't entered my 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 orbit yet. But I, I'm unsure about that. Um, Lisa, that was um, your question, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd throw it in here because you mentioned these numbers about other cooperatives and I, I don't know a lot about this, but this platform cooperative m movement in New York, they, they seem to be growing quite rapidly and it could be interesting in various ways, maybe also to involve them in field studies or whatever, because there's a lot going on there at the moment, apparently. Yeah, and I, I have a couple of friends that are involved in that uh, movement. Um, uh, that have been, uh, but I, 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 I'm not familiar with uh, empirical. Actually, that's not true. I, I did. I reviewed a piece uh, that had something to do specifically with this, but it was a couple of years back. Um, so people are, are are working, I guess, in this 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 space, but uh, it seems as though it's pretty nascent uh, as far as far as I know. Maybe others in the group would would be able to chime in on that. Um, Can you tell us if you rejected the paper or if you accepted it? <laughs> well, it, it, it might be somebody's paper that was here. I don't know. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I think I, I asked for um, a, a revision. I, I, I think I wanted to accept it. Let me put it like that. I, I'm not uh, sure. That's if a, very, accepted, a cooperative I, approach. I think... A cooperative <laughs> approach. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think uh, Roberto, you got another question. Yeah, I wanted to come back to this question of the um, limitation of the methodology. And uh, and I was wondering whether we are really touching to something which is a sort of uh, intrinsic limits concerning what you can really test about democracy uh, through experimental labs. And I wanted to ask whether um, Raimondello and Giulio, they want to enter into this conversation because they also uh, did some experimental labs on participation. And it seems to me but this is really an open question that uh, it's difficult to go beyond uh, a simple question concerning um, testing whether people who are given uh, freedom to this autonomy to decide are more motivated than people who are being told what they have to do. So maybe I, I mean, I, I, rem I remember uh, not correctly uh, Raimondello and, and Giulio, the kind of experiments you made, but it seems to me that more or less your uh, research question were, were very close to Phil's one. Um, I leave Raimondello to talk so he can introduce himself to Phil and I talked enough. So, so uh, Phil can also know a bit better Raimondello, our colleague uh, from Bologna too. <laughs> 
if he's still there, because I don't know. It's yes. Yeah, he was there. Hello. Yeah, he is. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, I'm still here, and uh, I, I enjoyed the, the presentation by Phil, so thank you very much. And, and uh, the point by Roberto is right. In the lab, we, we cannot do much more than uh, to test if there is a peer pressure be between workers, if we can motivate them by making them participating in decisions. So the uh, the, the, the tools by which we can test uh, the, the, the effect of participation, motivation uh, are not uh, many. I don't know if uh, Philip uh, uh, has tried uh, any, any other kind of uh, experiment in the lab or in the field. Uh, recently, we are trying to, to bring uh, this kind of test uh, in the field, so with workers rather than with the students, and this is much more interesting in, in our opinion. But uh, in the lab, uh, there are many, many, well, let's say uh, there are very good reasons also to, to run lab experiments, not only because they are less expensive in terms of uh, time and effort by experimenters, but also be, because uh, they are more controlled. So the, 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 other, the other issue Philip raised uh, rightly is uh, the, the, the issue of the external validity. Maybe uh, the, the field experiment are uh, a little uh, better in, in a little better position for uh, the external validity be, because uh, at least the subject are workers and so they are not just uh, 18 to 22 years old like uh, um, Philip told us before. But uh, there are many other problems with the field experiments and uh, so the, the 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 protocols and the the, the practice are, are um, getting better uh, year by year, but uh, we are trying to, to add some more tools to test this kind of question in the lab and in the field. But uh, from now, I, I have not much more to say uh, about the, the question by Robert. I don't know if Philip has uh, anything to add about that. Thank you. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, and, and nice to meet you. Um, I look forward to, to visiting uh, uh, more later as well. Um, so, I, I think I'll just I'll, I'll repeat a little bit of, of what I said before um, with with regards to uh, the external validity issue and the limits of the method. Um, and I, I don't want to belabor the point too much, uh, but the, it is it has limits. And there are, uh, in, in, in many respects, on the scope of questions that can be asked, on the insights that can be drawn, uh, et cetera. I mean, uh, and, and we've, we've kind of spoken about that at, 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 in some degree. Now, the same can be said of every methodology. Uh, the, there's something that's kind of interesting to me, just as someone who's done experiments, uh, that is I think worthy of study in some regards. Like, I'm not I'm not sure what what is salient about the experimental economic method that spawns the questions of external validity that is somehow absent to some degree of traditional econometric case studies, uh, for example. So let's say we find something in the there's a fire station across the street from me. If uh, we we study the, the fire station and the, the fire station has an interesting set of policies that we think might generalize to other settings. We don't know if it generalizes to other settings by studying the, 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 the fire station, right? But they're real world people doing uh, the work of, of, of firefighters and so on. Um, we could infer, we could inductively reason that, the, that other uh, 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 fire stations might have similar constructs and therefore behave in similar ways, but it's, the, the, the external validity of, of, of those case studies seems to uh, kind of not be as questioned because of the realness of it, despite the fact that in the lab, I mean, we have those, those same restrictions, but we can even, uh, we, we can change the, the, the institutional environment intentionally in order to try to derive insight on questions that uh, those real world uh, case study type settings are unable to to um, to uh, to so 
and even in the case of like worker cooperatives is, is one example. I actually feel like cooperatives are are, are an excellent uh, uh, place for lab studies specifically because the average size of them, I think, with some big exceptions, um, but I think in the, even the network of cooperatives and one that I've gone, I think the average size is is twelve people. Um, and uh, which we, we could have firms of 12 people in the lab uh, and, and cook up rules and institutions uh, for them. And, and not only 12, we could have 1,200 people in the lab, in which case we'd have more people almost than the entire universe of cooperators in the US currently. So uh, we, we, I, I think these methodological discussions are hugely important. And I think the, the, the awareness of uh, is is uh, has to be there. We have to be aware of what we're doing and what we're not doing um, as as researchers. Uh, that said, I mean I've done some some purely theoretical work uh, with that looks you know impressive with the, the the my first order and second order conditions and so on. And it's not valid to the extent that the uh, conditions of the world are outside of my model, which means that it is not valid probably at all right but we can still learn something from the the production of the theory uh as well so um i yeah. I, I, I don't mean to 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 um oh let's see there's something here in the chat um yeah well <laughs> sort of i i suppose they take it seriously um it, it depends on the audience sometimes sometimes uh sometimes yes sometimes no um so, but I, uh, I, I think I think more more than that, it's just ser being taken seriously or not. It's about being a part of a, a conversation and uh, and listening. And part of the thing I like about the uh, the the interdisciplinary group that I'm a part of here in the U.S. is uh, I'm learning a lot from uh, the presentations of of others. Uh, usually, when I go to a conference in in experimental economics. It's really for me. It's for feedback on my paper that I that I give to others. Uh, when I'm going to the inter interdisciplinary seminars, I find that I'm learning a lot as a participant, which is, which is great. That it's um, uh, you know makes me think about new designs and new potential projects moving forward. So um, anyway, um, that's uh, my, my remark there. I, I think I didn't saw any other questions, so I would sneak my own question in here. Um, for the last few minutes we got. Um, and I was wondering about the, the time dimension of, of the experiments you talked about. Um, so my hypothesis would be that this kind of effort might decline over time. And I was wondering, would it be possible to also have like an experimental setting that captures that kind of this time dimension of like, at first, people are really enthusiastic about now I can have this voice option and then maybe after two or three weeks, the whole kind of effect on the effort dimension declines. And so I was wondering about what you think on that point. Uh, I think it's a, a, a very good, very good point. Um, again, the, the, the inside of the study kind of shows a uh, I, I wouldn't I, I could guess as to what might happen. My guess is that there would be a diminishing effect, um, perhaps. Uh, but but then again, maybe not in the study. We don't have that as a dimension. So um, but if there were to be a study that uh, did have this long term effect to see whether um, participation diminishes, um, my my best guess is that these institutions have to be continuously practiced and also there has to be awareness of those institutions in uh, democratic enterprises um i think that happens through um kind of the production of of an ideology that what people are doing in these enterprises is uh, somewhat special, perhaps. I, this, this, I'm just guessing at, the, at this stage, but I, I do think that there has to be some kind of uh, continuous production of um, of the awareness of what they're doing is, is something that's special and therefore not something else that is less preferable, which might be um, uh, alienating to some extent for the the the, uh, the workers. Um, but I, 
I, I do think that we, 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 we could establish some kind of, um, again, long term longitudinal study under controlled circumstances. It may not be the uh, the, the lab experiment type setting, but where we, we might be able to see where the intervals of um, um, it, uh, kind of the, the production of the ideology uh, moments uh, happen. I do know of some studies, again, in different literature in uh, organizational management uh, using some uh, uh, social psych psychological experiments, which kind of have a different set of rules than economics experiments uh, that allow them to, to study questions in some sense that are more broad. Um, that might address some of the concerns that we have here in um, the, the heart of the experimental economic method is this idea that uh, the observations that we collect are uh, costly in, in some respects so that the subjects will be um, uh, performing in a manner that uh, is consistent with their payment in the study itself. And that is a methodological convention that also has some problems to it. But in some of the social social psychological work on these um, longer term studies of, of leadership specifically, uh, on when is the appropriate interval to interject on some kind of team building exercise for uh, workers. And I, I have seen some research uh, in, in, in that realm, uh, which I think would be um, uh, uh, relevant for, for your idea that there would need to be some kind of um, repeated reminder of uh, that someone is, is being allowed to participate in something um, versus uh, the, the counterfactual of, of just some kind of unilateral decision making. Mm. Yeah, sounds um so we got any further questions for philip i'm just gonna look in the chat um i think it's not the case <laughs> and i mean we got five more minutes officially with our slight delay at the beginning um so i think we can all thank phil for the very interesting presentation and the, the q and a um I'm really sorry about the, the Zoom link. Um, maybe if you want to put stress on somebody, a uh, good idea <laughs> to simulate a non-functioning Zoom link 10 minutes before the presentation. Um, that's uh, kind of stressful. But um, yeah, <laughs> Roberto, you want to add anything else? Or maybe the next seminar would be something. We've got another seminar coming. Uh, yeah, good um, idea. April 15th with uh, Abraham Singer. He's a political theorist and he's going to talk about the idea of non public reason revisited. And I think it's going to be more kind of a theoretical work on the justification of workplace democracy. Um, he's still <laughs> in an early stage there. Um, that's what he told me. And yeah, so see you if, in the next time, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, uh, Philip. And, and, and uh, Alex, if if you if you would uh, or or Roberto, um, it'd be great if.